Good evening, everyone. This is uh, Benedict Lecca, director of the Redwood Library, and I want to welcome you to the library and uh, Athenaeum in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, I'm the executive director, and tonight I am introducing once again John Church. Uh, this is the third in the series of uh, Palaces of Repose. Uh, but first, before I continue, um, there have been some issues with the sound. Uh, there's a compatibility mode. If you click up on the right hand, upper right hand to help and click the button there, uh, all of the sound problems will miraculously go away. So that's important. Um, so tonight, uh, you know, we've, we've been all over Europe, Sweden last week, uh, this week in uh, Potsdam where, uh, as all of you know, since you're, you're worldly and educated and sophisticated, um, well, my particular interest, uh, very fine uh, French paintings of the 18th century, fabulous Vatos, L'Ancre, Chardin, Boucher, all those. Uh, but he's going to be talking about the architecture, um, as you know. So uh, I want to welcome uh, you, the viewers, and also John Church. So thank you very much, and um, I will see you in a moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benedict, and good evening, everyone. It's a, always a pleasure to be here at Redwood Library, especially for this, Palaces of Repose, which I'm going to bring on the screen. And why did I pick this topic, Palaces of Repose, and what does it mean? I'm not covering palaces in this series that are the centers, the epicenters of royal power. I'm focusing on those ensembles of buildings that were retreats for a royal court. And because of that sense of retreat, one could relax at least to a degree, just to a degree, royal court protocol. It left architects and designers freer, one could say freer, to experiment with architectural forms and planning. Well, if we come to the old kingdom of Prussia uh, in uh, northeastern Germany in the 18th century, we come here to Potsdam and to this particular palace known as Sans Souci, the residence created by Frederick of Prussia, known as Frederick the Great. <coughs> Excuse me. Sans Souci was created in the 1740s for Frederick the Great. Now, when he first came to the throne as a young monarch, the first thing he did was seize the province of Silesia, the Duchy of Silesia, from Maria Therese of Austria. He managed to pull it off. Prussia was a small kingdom, but he had great ambitions for it. And the Prussian military, the Prussian army, was one of the best in Europe. But Prussia was not a rich country. And this would play out in this area known as Potsdam, just outside of Berlin, which became the retreat of the Hohenzollern monarchs of Prussia. And because they were a bit cash strapped, unlike the Russian czars and the kings of France, they depended far more on good design rather than rich materials. And I think for that reason, Potsdam is an interesting lesson in design and architecture. I'm going to bring you up the steps of this palace. Oh, by the way, uh, Frederick the Great won Silesia. The Austrians never regained it. And of course, every time he won a battle, won a victory, expanded his realm, he would build at Potsdam, at Sans Souci. Let's climb up the steps and see what happens here. Once we come up to the main floor, we see the words Sans Souci written above the entrance. French for without care. Nothing says more palace of repose than this place of retreat. This was a very private realm for Frederick. To be invited to Sans Souci was a special, special occasion, only his intimates. He also was known to have said that Sans Souci would only be for his lifetime. He was not overly concerned with what would happen to it after his reign had ended. And that's a very interesting point we'll get into later in terms of its future. The architect was Georg von Knobelsdorf, but Frederick was truly the architect. 
because he demanded certain things. Nobelsdorf had said that the palace, this first floor that you're seeing, which sits directly on the ground, should sit on a, a foundation. Frederick did not want that. He wanted to be able to walk directly into his garden. And the building sits on the crest of a hill to take in the views. And it was on a, it's on a terraced hill. And the next image will show this. Here's Sans Souci up close. By the way, these figures are term figures which grow out of a post and then hold up the very uh, lintel. Um, there are very few columns, grand arches. These uh, figures give this playful quality and a sculptural richness to the building. But here you see the aerial view of the entire plan. There is the pavilion of Sans Souci at the very top. There are only 10 rooms in the palace proper. Reception rooms, the king's bedroom. The queen was never welcome here. His queen resided at another palace. There's a semicircle colonnade uh, on the top of the screen, uh, top of the slide. That was the formal entrance. And then you see what one could call a waterfall of terraces below. Now, in those terraces, there were small greenhouses, and he propagated uh, grapes here as well as figs. Here's the original plan, again, as conceived by Frederick himself. This is a very personal as well as a private creation. Here you see the main palace, the terraces moving down, and then a proper French parterre at the very bottom, those embroidered type of gardens, and then bosquets, these woodlands to the left and the right with radiating paths running through them. Sans Souci is very much a, co a combination of both French and Italian influences made into a German creation. Here you see a more fully developed plan. This uh, plan was done in the uh, 17, uh, late 1760s, and it shows the evolution of the site. On the right-hand side, you see Sans Souci, the pavilion with the terraced garden. But then, as you move, that's on the right-hand side of the screen. As you move your eye to the left towards the center, well, that is the English garden, the picturesque park. And that concept of the natural, picturesque landscape, where barely do you see a straight line, this is becoming the rage in Europe. Of course, the English develop it. Marie Antoinette begins to perfect it at her own uh, gardens, at the Petit Trianon, and Frederick, lover of all things French, is very influenced, actually, by French picturesque gardens of the later 18th century in the creation of this. Now, on the far left of the screen, you'll see a plan of great formality. If you can see the cursor, you see a semicircle here and a grand palace. This is called the New Palace. It's a palace Frederick barely ever lived in. It was a show palace. That was built in the late 1760s, once he had, well, triumphed, but in fact survived. Uh, his wars against France and uh, the Austrian Empire. Prussia was bankrupted by these wars, but she was victorious. So Frederick built a grand palace to show, or to try to convince people, that Prussia was a wealthy state. The almost comic thing about the new palace is the fact that it's meant to look like brick, but it's actually painted plaster. Almost everything in the new palace is faux. But it, 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 it really is very telling about the personality of Frederick the Great and his, his intentions for Sans Souci and its park. He lived in his small pavilion at the top of his terraces. He only entertained heads of state or visiting ambassadors in the new palace and barely ever spent an evening there. That was a palace for show. The Sans Souci pavilion was a palace for repose. So let's go back to the pavilion itself. Here you see it in the full flower of summer. The terraces supporting vines on the walls of grapes and the small greenhouses. One thing in summer and a very different feeling in winter. There it is. So interesting when the foliage is not in bloom. But another key feature, the doors that shut, these are miniature greenhouses, these niches where the king propagated fig trees, which had to winter over. I wasn't able to get the right image when I was in Potsdam, but at sunset, the glass in those doors shimmers. 
one is not sure if one is if Sans Souci is sitting on some kind of magical waterfall. And I had the privilege of going to Potsdam twice. Um, way back in 1992, I was invited by the National Trust for Historic Preservation to lead us to lead both a tour for their upper level members and give a series of lectures uh, in what is uh, was former Eastern Germany. Potsdam was preserved pretty much even through the uh, World War II. It was not subject to the bombings of Berlin, only a few miles away. Of course, in the 1990s, Potsdam and all of the palaces, Frederick the Great's pavilion and the smaller villas built by the Prussian members of the Prussian royal family were all designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. What was interesting for me is my family is from Silesia, which was the Aust in the Austrian Empire until Frederick the Great took it away in 1740, and I was the first member of my family to go behind what would have been called the Iron Curtain since the family fled uh, in 1945. Let's go into the palace itself. First you walk into the columned hall. And the walls are actually treated in paint. Of course, it's a faux marbleizing to come in. You walk through this reception hall with its grand row of Corinthian columns and then make your way into the main reception room, which is an oval hall. And this is the oval projection that then looks out onto the gardens. The floors are of marble inlay. The columns are of solid marble shafts in this case. And it's here that Frederick gave his famous dinner parties, uh, one of the most famous or a series of famous dinner parties between 1750 and 1753 for none other than Voltaire, who he invited to be a member of his court for those few years until Voltaire decided he couldn't take Frederick the Great's dictatorial behavior and went back to France. Here's the ceiling uh, covered in uh, stucco work and gilding. The craft level was quite high here. We don't know who actually built the pavilion. There's no list of workmen, but Frederick the Great's father, Frederick I, had invited many French craftsmen to come to uh, uh, Brandenburg at the time, Prussia, uh, after Louis XIV evoked the edict, uh, revoked the Edict of Nantes in the late, seven, in the late 1600s. Of course, taking uh, removing tolerance for Protestants in France, so many Protestant or Huguenot or Huguenot workmen were invited to Prussia, and so it's thought that this high level of craftsmanship in stucco, in gilding, was the result of this flood of talented French craftsmen coming to Prussia. In Potsdam, there was a Huguenot village. There was a village for French workers, so they were very close by. And as you go through the series of rooms, all in a line, or as the French would call it, enfilade, you are in a Rococo series of rooms. Frederick the Great loved French culture, and he was a devotee of the Rococo, its lightness. It's Frederick the Great who began to collect great works of French art, which are still in Berlin today. Uh, the the uh, pilgrimage to Sither, the great painting by Antoine Watteau, you know, one of the iconic works of the uh, Rococo period, uh, is in Berlin. Uh, works by Lancre. All of these were during Frederick's time. This is the music room. And of course, he fancied himself a musician. He was a good musician. Uh, the Brandenburg Concerto was one of the great works done during his reign. You can see the lightness of touch with these Rococo interiors the delicacy of the stucco ornamentation on the walls and, uh, and the plaster work on the ceilings, lightly gilded. These are directly influenced by the works of French designers, especially Justarel Maisonnier and Nicolas Pino, who were, who were creating pattern books. And by the way, those two pattern books uh, live here at the Redwood Library in the wonderful architectural pattern book collection I've worked with. And so this is what uh, Frederick is importing to Germany. The floor is, uh, was inlaid. It was several rare woods, a black walnut and then cherry. This is not an 18th century painting, but it is a 19th century romantic painting 
looking back at Frederick the Great's reign. It's often used as this iconic image uh, celebrating the Rococo splendor of his reign. And you, he, you have Frederick himself playing the flute in, in the very music room I've just shown you. Here's the other side of it. To say this was a great military leader, on the other side, in his private life, Frederick was a person of great culture. He was considered one of the benevolent despots. I always think those words cancel each other out. But he did want to reform uh, Prussia. He wanted to abolish serfdom, but there was pushback from his Junkers, from his aristocratic ruling class. His particular love was music. And again, he did invite Voltaire to come stay at his court. Voltaire at this time was a superstar of the European intellectual scene. And Voltaire did enjoy the attention at first. He did, he did enjoy the relaxed atmosphere of Sanssouci, divorced of all royal protocol, where he was treated as an equal. But in a way, the two egos of the two men were a match for each other, and he eventually left. And in the end, Vol, uh, Frederick the Great did not institute as many of the enlightened reforms as he had hoped, which happened to many of these absolute rulers in the 18th century. Here's one of the most private of private rooms at the end of one of the wings of Sanssouci. This is the study of Frederick the Great himself, a light Rococo touch. Rococo design is very much based on ornament and detail rather than overarching architectural features. So you will not find in these private Rococo chambers grand arches, grand columns, heavy door frames. What you find is delicate curvilinear ornament the gilding that you see, the vines, the flowers. And of course, this, this quivering serpentine line in all forms, the legs of the furniture, the outlines of the architectural, uh, of the interiors, it's often called the line of beauty. Here's a detail of his study, and then here's a closer up detail of the cabinets. It's remarkably intact. That is because no other monarch after Frederick ever used this as a primary residence. So there were no changes to it. So you are stepping into a time capsule of the Rococo age. And the bedroom of all bedrooms, this was the guest bedroom at Sans Souci. And it's the very room where Voltaire lived. He had a suite of rooms. And the, it's, it's uh, in its original yellow color, it's, it's, it's laid on very thickly, a very thick layer of yellow paint with a painted very naturalistic ornament. And this print, of the meeting of, of Voltaire and Frederick the Great in the library at Sanssouci is very telling. Voltaire is seated in his dressing gown. The king has come to Voltaire. Voltaire has not come to the king. And the king is dressed in his military uniform as a ruler. But just this notion and that Voltaire is seated, now he's seated at a desk, which was the repository of ideas and creative action in the 18th century. Nonetheless, though, who is the king or who is the primary being in this, in this universe? So this is a very interesting, almost satirical drawing of the king catering to the thinker. Now, out in the gardens, Voltaire's approach to landscape, excuse me, for the great's approach to landscape, excuse me, was very much influenced by the Rococo paintings he was purchasing, which showed very romantic woodlands with these elaborate French trellises in them. This is one of the most remarkable surviving 18th century trellises inspired by French design, uh, still in existence. There were several at Versailles, uh, several were demolished, but here you see this um, elaborate woodwork in French trellis design with these Corinthian style pilasters and then a sunburst at the very top. The uh, pattern for this was from a French book called The Art of Joinery, or La de Menuisier, which was published by Monsieur Roubault, a French woodworker, a joiner, a uh, maker of wood, uh, in, the, in 1769. Now, what's interesting is that book is also in Newport. It's not at Redwood Library, but it's in the library of Marvel House. And it was owned by none other than uh, Mrs. William K. Vanderbilt, who, of course, used French design very much like Frederick the Great used it. You know, a woman of, uh, I think she could, match, she could have matched uh, Frederick, Frederick the Great uh, 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 very easily. And here is the trellising extending from it 
in a very French manner with the uh, espalier trees and then the white marble urns and the busts of ancient Roman philosophers on these pedestals, classic French garden design. And then, the, of course, this overlooks the terraces that descend from the building. And there it is. Now let's go, let's go into the garden. So in high summer, you can make your way down the terraces with their grapevines and their figs in bloom in, in, inside the doorway niches. Then you make your way into the parterre gardens. The, the palace really sits so luxuriantly amongst the greenery. And you can step right out from the door into that greenery. And that was the magic of Potsdam. And as you make your way into the canal system, you see how you can embed in this greenery. And the park was there. And as you made your way through the park, you would come upon a variety of follies. This is the Chinese house designed in the 1760s for Frederick the Great. Interestingly enough, his sister Ulrika would marry the king of Sweden. And she would build a Chinese house for herself, or it was built for her by the king. Uh, at Drottningholm, which I lectured on in our first lecture. So uh, this fascination for the, well, what the French would term chinoiserie, this, this Western interpretation of the Chinese style, was typical throughout the courts of Europe, and Frederick wanted his own example. This is a work of complete fantasy, of course. And uh, the, uh, the wooden elements have been recently regilded, and here you see them shining in this. On the very top of the building is an Asian figure with a parasol, and let me bring you into some of the detail. Here you see these Asian figures with these very fanciful hats sitting at the base of columns, which are modeled after Corinthian columns, but are actually meant to be palm trees. Now, there's, there's very little that is authentically Asian about any of this. This, of course, is complete Rococo fantasy world. Inside, the same sense of theater goes on. You'll notice the Rococo style wall brackets uh, to the left and right of the door and windows in the center. Uh, beautiful curving wooden lines of those brackets. And then atop them are blue and white Chinese porcelains. Uh, and then along the top of the ceiling is a Western interpretation of a Chinese court scene. They're leaning over the balcony. There are exotic birds. It's this complete escape into a fantasy world. And this pavilion was used as a a destination to walk to in the garden. The king gave lunch parties here, tea parties, and, and things of that nature. Here's another view of it with the columns outside, right through the windows. This was before repainting. This is after repainting. So the, the original 18th century colors have been restored. And let's explore the park a bit more. Here's a black and white version of that same map I showed you. Let's go into the gardens a bit further. Here's the new palace, right here at the end. This was meant to be his grandiose statement for all the victories in Europe. There's something else that the palace has to reveal about his victories in Europe, by the way, by the 1760s. There is a statue here. It may be hard to see the detail, but there are the three graces who are dancing in a circle. But the king had them carved in the likenesses of the, the three female rivals he had in Europe. Madame de Pompadour, the mistress of Louis XV of France, the Empress Maria Theresa of Austria, and the Empress Catherine the Great, who all three despised Frederick but he managed to beat them in his various wars. So he always said that they topped his palace, a form of satire. This may look like a grand palace. It's grand in scale, but again, the walls are not red brick. They're plaster uh, meant to look like red brick, and inside is faux marbling throughout. When you first enter, you actually enter the grotto room from the garden which is inset with thousands of shells, small pebbles, and rocks. As it's a glorious work of craftsmanship, and it also is not as expensive as sheer marble interiors. You would not find a hall of mirrors like you have at Versailles here at Potsdam. Often people have said Sans Souci, the small pavilion, is like a trianon, like the Petit Trianon at Versailles, where the king would retreat. Not so. The retreat pavilion came first at, at Potsdam, 
the Grand Palace only came after. Here's a detail. Rocks, shells, and then very brightly colored and painted rocks and shells mounted to the walls. So this is the room you entered upon. And then the entire core of the palace was taken up by this, the marble hall, and then adjacent to it, the grand salon for entertaining. Everything, the floor is marble, but the walls are faux marble. And the ceiling is gilded plaster. And here's the adjacent room as well, all in white plaster. This is the, uh, uh, another of the grand, there were four other reception rooms. And again, you'll actually, although it's grand, there's a great restraint in the stucco work and the plaster work of the ceiling because of expense. Again, this was a palace of artifice for show. But nonetheless, it was quite beautiful. This is a great Rococo interior. Here you see plaster that's been gilded and white plaster in imitation of marble and a very delicate rendering in the ceiling in tones of ivory and pale green. So I think this is one of the more masterful rooms in terms of design quality, harmony of design, and not overdoing it compared to the other chambers. This is the smaller dining room with a magnificent display of, uh, of a European white porcelain at the end on their original Rococo mounts. And this is how porcelain was intended to be displayed in the 18th century. Uh, in 1722, not in Prussia, but just to the south in Saxony, uh, a man named Botger, uh, working in Meissen, uh, finally uh, discovered the recipe for making soft paste porcelain. So they would not have to import from China as they had been. And so porcelain uh, factories begin to pop up throughout the royal courts of Europe, and a Berlin factory was established as well. And porcelain was so rare and so expensive that it was often displayed on these wall mounts. And here's an original example. This is the silvered room uh, in Rococo taste, of course, with swirls and curls everywhere. But it has one of the finest floors in the whole palace complex, again, in black walnut, cherry, and lighter fruit woods. It's interesting, this uh, very over-the-top palace became the palace of choice in the late 19th century when Kaiser Wilhelm, more infamous for his role in World War uh, one, uh, he chose this palace. He did not use the smaller palace. He admired Frederick the Great very much. He almost made a cult figure out of him. But he loved the sort of pastiche quality of this palace and entertained here often. Here's a detail of the silvered room. Uh, remarkable mirror frame in gilding. Uh, silver gilt, excuse me. Uh, silver, silver, excuse me, silvered furniture. The uh, mir mirror is 18th century, but the two chairs are what are, is called Wilhelmine Rococo. It's the Rococo that's revived in the 1880s by uh, Kaiser Wilhelm. And here's the great uh, banqueting hall with its foam marbled walls, but superb gilded plaster on the ceiling. A very fine marble floor. And these great lampposts were added. The palace is pretty much an original 18th century creation in its architecture, but these lampposts were added in the 1890s by Kaiser Wilhelm. Completely over the top Belle Epoque design, taking the Baroque era, but even making it more Baroque than it ever had been. It's typical of Kaiser Wilhelm. There were other additions now by 19th century monarchs to Potsdam after the reign of Frederick the Great ended in the late 18th century. Uh, Frederick William III added this, and it's called the Orangerie Palace. It was inspired by the Villa Medici in Rome, and most of the palace is a conservatory, an orangerie. The rooms for the king and queen are in the very center, but to the left and right, it's magnificent uh, greenhouses at either side. For me, there's a very special complex of buildings waiting to be seen at Potsdam. I think the jewel in the whole ensemble. 
Here's the remainder of the uh, Orangerie Palace, as they call it. But it's here. I want to speak about another complex of buildings and a remarkable architect named Karl Friedrich Schinkel, who worked for the Prussian royal family from the early 1800s through the 1830s. Now, at that time, in the early 1800s, Prussia suffered the humiliation of Napoleon occupying Prussia. When Napoleon left, they had to rebuild the Prussian state. Again, Prussia was not a wealthy nation like Russia or the Austrian Empire or France. The Hohenzollern monarchs were always cash-strapped. What Schinkel gave them was good design with inexpensive materials. Remarkably, most of Schinkel's buildings survive. Now, the river from Berlin into the realm of Potsdam is known as the River Havel, H-A-V-E-L. And along that river, many members of the Prussian royal family built small, small summer villas. And Schinkel would design almost all of them. This is the first built for a member of the Prussian royal family uh, out, outside of Pot, uh, near in Potsdam called Schloss Glienicke. Let's take a look at it. Here it is. One small, one small core of a building with these long uh, pergolas added at either side overlooking the picturesque river Havel with its, with its, uh, its water grasses. Schenkel used the writings of the ancient Roman writer Pliny the Younger, who wrote about his seaside villa at Tusco at, at Laurentium, which had turrets for looking out over the water and pergolas for walking under. And Schinkel created a reduced version of this. The building itself is very simple. It's a brick building covered in stucco, but it's this economy of materials, but good classical design. The pergola is not even made of round columns, which would have been expensive to build. They're square posts, so you can easily just stack up the bricks. But the park around Schloss Glienicke was a marvel. It was designed by Carl Linné, L-I-N-N-E. And Linné was a magnificent botanist who was developing the Linnaean system for uh, categorizing plant material. And Linné designs for Schloss Glienicke this picturesque park. There already was an English park in the mid to late 18th century established uh, at the base of Sanssouci by Frederick the Great. By the early 1800s, the picturesque movement is in full swing, and you'll see there's barely a straight line anywhere here. You see the, uh, the Schloss itself is down here in the lower part of the image. You see in the water, you have open lawn here, and then you go into the woodlands here. Schinkel's work in architecture and Linné's work in botany would influence the further development of the Sanssouci Park. Here's one last glimpse of uh, Schloss Glienicke. One could see an ancient Roman wandering about this. This is the age of, of high romantic classicism, and Schinkel was one of the great uh, creators of it. Some, Schinkel's reputation was somewhat dimmed uh, when the Iron Curtain went up in 1945, because many Western scholars did not have access to his work, it was slowly forgotten except amongst the cognoscenti, and with the collapse of the Iron Curtain, with the unification of Germany in the late 1980s, scholarship began, in the West began to turn again to Eastern Germany and Eastern Europe, and Schinkel was rediscovered. He was shown, there were exhibitions of his work at Yale, in New York, publications of his work, and he's completely reappreciated today. Now, let's go to what I consider one of his masterworks. This is the Charlottenhof in the park at Sanssouci, literally a 20-minute walk from Frederick the Great's small palace of Sanssouci. This was built by Frederick the Great's grandson, uh, King Frederick William IV a romantic classicist if there ever was one. And Schinkel created for him this small Roman villa. And this is where the king spent spring, summer, and fall, to be quite honest. There's a simplicity to the building, a paring down of the walls. And then you have the Doric colonnade and pediment at the very center. 
Here's an original image of it set in its picturesque garden. It is entirely intact today. There you see the pergola on the, on the left and then the pergola on the right. The furnishings are entirely intact because the royal family would only use this for luncheons and daytime visits after, so there was never any redecorating or remodeling of this perfect uh, 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 neoclassical specimen created in the set in the 1820s and 30s. Here's the entrance hall. Again, Schinkel's, Schinkel's version in Germany of an ancient Roman villa. Marble base for the stairwell. Uh, a porcelain plaques, actually, imitating marble. We'd call it biscuit, uh, the plaques on the stairwell. And then paintings along the ceiling inspired by those, a very 19th century interpretation of uh, 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 ancient Roman wall painting. You enter the main salon, it's this romantic recreation of what a Roman villa might have been. The prints on the walls are of uh, the ancient Roman wall paintings at Nero's Golden House in Rome and various villas uh, throughout Pompeii. And mind you, Pompeii had been rediscovered in uh, 1748. So only about a half century of archaeology have been going on there. All of the furniture is designed by Schinkel, the light fixtures, and he loved bold primary colors, the reds, the blues, and the gilding. And then from here you go into the private quarters of the family and you really see Schinkel's color sense uh, at work. Here is the silver doorway based on ancient Roman designs with its honeysuckle motif on the door. You enter the blue room, uh, the, uh, the uh, small boudoir uh, of the king. Then you pass into the empress's sitting room in this rose color with silvered frames showing dancing maidens, all based, again, on wall paintings from Pompeii and Herculaneum. And the furniture is silvered. That's, uh, the, the sofa is modeled after ancient Roman sofas. And there's a view from her room into the apple green sitting room. So very brilliant, striking colors uh, of this 1820s and 30s period, all intact. And this is the tent room. This is the bedroom of the princesses. Um, military tent rooms were made fashionable by Napoleon himself. And then the ra it, it, it remained the rage right through the 1820s and 30s. And you have this very bold empire fabric uh, with these folding camp chairs for the two princesses. This is considered one of the great classic empire period interiors of the age. And the terrace itself, there's an economy of material here. The building, again, is uh, brick covered in stucco. There's not a great deal of architectural ornament. The uh, honeysuckle motif over the doorway that you see here, and the acroterian design, they call it, this leaf design, this is, a, a, this is a stenciled onto the building, and the borders are painted. The garden furniture placed on the porch, based on ancient Roman designs, it's adapted, it's not an exact copy, but the table with its animal legs and lion's paw, and the animal legs here, are inspired by the metal furniture from ancient Rome discovered at Pompeii. Schinkel is using the new emerging technology of cast iron, not wrought iron by hand, but casting of iron. And he makes several iterations of garden furniture for the uh, uh, royal family, which are all still there. And let's go out. I mean, need I say more about romantic classicism? Here you see uh, this front view of the Charlottenhof. Uh, uh, Frederick William IV's wife's name was Charlotte, so it's named for Queen Charlotte. The pergola is on the left, and then you descend into the rose garden. Now, Josephine was famous for her roses at Malmaison, and so they are contemporaries, and so they create rose gardens here at the Charlottenhof. They're far more informal, however. They let the roses trail on the, on the uh, arbor in the front of the palace, and then you have a semicircle of garden beds, and they have standard roses, uh, which they allow to be a bit looser than in, in French gardens. There's an aerial shot of it 
earlier in the season as, as the roses are coming into bloom. And so this is a metal trellis that uh, it acts almost like an awning and the roses trail over it. And here is the garden plan uh, by Linné for the entire Charlotten Hof. And so here, if you can follow the cursor, is the Charlotten Hof. This is the rose garden that I showed you here. And then here is the serpentine lake. You see the curving paths. And up here are a complex of buildings that I'll show you in a moment, the gardener's house and the Roman baths. Down in the lower right-hand side of the screen is also a detail of this, the elaborate gardener's house and the Roman baths. The family could walk to this destination, formal gardens here. And then over here is nature's amphitheater. You go into a wooded grove then you come upon this amphitheater, and there could be various parties given here, uh, theatricals and the like. And seconds over that, here we go. Here, I think, is another remarkable building by Schinkel. This is called the Gardener's House. Now, yes, the gardener for the garden at Potsdam did live here, but this area with the great pergola was reserved for the royal family. This was their picnicking area, and they could overlook the Serpentine Lake. Now, Schinkel is doing something here that's quite new for the time. In the, seven, in the 1820s, this gardener's house is not looking to ancient Greek or Roman sources, as is the main uh, house at the, of the Charlottenhof. This is looking to the medieval fortified farmhouses of northern Italy. You see the heavy round arches, the eaves overhanging, there's a tower over here. And the notion of the pergola, bringing the building into nature, letting vines grow up this, the vine-covered house. Well, Schinkel is not the sole inventor of a new style, but the Italianate style, which would dominate 19th century design in the 1840s and 50s. Newport has plenty of Italianate houses. Uh, prince Albert of saxe coburg gotha the German prince who would marry his cousin, Queen Victoria, in 1850, would design Osborne House on the Isle of Wight in an Italianate mode. As a young man, he's growing up seeing early versions of this built by many German royal and ducal families. And one can say it starts at least in its most sophisticated form. I don't know if this is the very first one, but in its most sophisticated form in the hands of Schinkel. And this is his watercolor rendering of the house. So the Italian eight is a style invented by a German. And here it is as it looks today, remarkably preserved. You see the flatness of the walls, the overhang of the roof, the tower and those very heavy round arches, and then the, the, the royal uh, dining area to the left here. Here's another view of it, that magnificent pergola. And here's the dining area. They staged it, Schinkel staged it, <clears throat> with a plaster and terracotta casts of ancient Roman ornament and an ancient Roman bench in, in stone here. And they could sit here and gaze across the lake, which the house sits upon. And this is one side of it. So this is the gardener's cottage, the gardener's house here, and the tower I showed you. Then behind it, is the Roman bathhouse where the family could take their plunge baths. And it sits again on this picturesque pond, this serpentine element. The building itself though, classic Schinkel, it's quite simple. It may look like a grand ensemble, but these are simple brick posts that are then stuccoed. So no elaborate carving was required. Schinkel designed as a master of form, simple classical form, with a lot, a lot of excess ornamentation, without a lot of excess detail. The same with the gardener's house. It's stucco, uh, it's, it's, it's brick covered in stucco, uh, then tinted the color and with just simple round arches. And if you need to have an image that speaks to this notion of a palace of repose, then this image hmm, will begin to come, come clear. This is the entrance to 
the bathhouse. In it is a large marble water basin, and the walls are painted in imitation in Roman, in Pompeian red, uh, of Pompeian wall paintings. The plunge bath is the room just beyond this, and then after the royals took their plunge, they could come back out. And here this is on a misty spring day. Nothing speaks more of this notion of repose. It truly is in Potsdam with this whole complex of pavilions, palaces, villas, gardeners houses and baths. It's this um, manifestation of the 18th and the early 19th century love of these small pavilions where architects in a way were given free reign. They were not constrained by the protocol of a main palace with a chamber, antechamber, rooms of parade, reception room, the throne room. Here they could let their uh, imaginations run free and that's the very essence of a palace of repose. Um, I'm going to end the talk here now and I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen and I can certainly open this up towards questions and uh, commentary. And I have the uh, questions on the side. I'm happy to take them. You can type them in. One person said here, wood, thought it was metal. Yes, um, the uh, uh, wood is used throughout these buildings to, uh, in imitation of stone, in imitation of metal, it's painted black and whatnot. So I'll wait for any questions. For those of you who are signing off, thank you so much for coming. Oh, you're most welcome, Alice. And I'm glad I could give you some repose through this talk. I think it's very much needed. And uh, it's interesting to see these uh, time capsules uh, and to visit them. They're wonderful records. And you know, we're in a city such as Newport where we have so many buildings and interiors and objects uh, that are records of the past from what they have to say about the culture of the time to the materials used to the decorative finishes and I think that's the, that's the beauty of any historic community. So thank you all for your kind remarks. I'm glad you enjoyed the lecture. And I will turn this back to Benedict Lecca, who will make uh, closing remarks and uh, talk about uh, my next lecture. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Benedict. The, 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 the virtual screen is all yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, once again, uh, great talk by John Church. Um, marvelous stuff, it really is. I mean, the, the German Rococo is just amazing. Um, next week, we will be going to Russia with John Church. Uh, Tsarko Silo, the Tsar's village. I know nothing about um, this uh, palace, and so I'll be very anxious to uh, listen to what he has to say. Um, here's a quick description to uh, whet your appetite. This country retreat of the Romanov dynasty is a Baroque fantasy in royal blue and gilding. Uh, the Russian talent for creating rich ornamental detail in wood, stucco, gold, and semi-precious stones produced a realm of unparalleled opulence. So uh, I want to thank John Church again, uh, and I want to uh, thank all of you, the viewers, um, and I also want to uh, acknowledge the uh, generous support of uh, the Jarzombek family, uh, Marianne um, and uh, Michelle Drum, and uh, I want to thank them again for uh, supporting this uh, lecture. Um, also, uh, please visit our website for a full schedule of our fall programming. We've got lots of very good lectures coming up. And um, so next week will be uh, John Church in Russia. So thank you very much and see you next week. Thank you. <laughs>